Quantum mechanics is a notoriously complicated and confusing subject. And part of that is for good reason. I mean, there really are these crazy phenomena happening in the quantum world that are challenging to imagine. But uh, one of the reasons quantum mechanics is complicated is that there are all these complex numbers all over the place. And at first, when you're getting into the subject, it's very confusing. Why are we using complex numbers? What do they mean? Why can't we use real numbers? Isn't this physics, not math? What? Why, why do we use these crazy numbers, right? So that was the source of confusion, for me at least, for quite a long period of time. And then one day it clicked, and I finally understood, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, actually, that complex numbers are what we want to use in quantum mechanics. So, what are the complex numbers, anyway? I think the most defining feature of the complex numbers is that they're a two-dimensional number. And that seems scandalous, but... If you've been using the real number line, then you're already kind of complicit in using a two-dimensional number system. Eh, sort of. Because when you write a real number, you write its magnitude, but you also assign it to one of the two number rays, either positive or negative. So you already have this sense of magnitude and direction in your number system, it's just that you only have two options for the direction, positive or negative. So the direction dimension of the real numbers is just a discrete binary thing rather than a continuous thing. And all the complex numbers really are is a generalization of that positive-negative binary. That is, the complex numbers can be regarded as a generalization of positivity and negativity, so that a number can be not only on either the positive or negative number ray, but also all of the number rays in between. This is a very strange concept the first time you see it. Now, if you're mostly used to uh, using numbers to count things, this seems like an affront to reason. Because after all, if you consider the number 2, for example, so you could have positive 2, you could have negative 2. But with the complex numbers, you could also have this 2 that's just somewhere in this space of... <laughs> this somewhere in this circle that has radius 2. The number with magnitude 2 in the complex plane can be at any one of these points. And that doesn't seem right, because you'll notice when 2 is up, just purely pointing straight up, then it's neither positive nor negative, and yet it's still 2. It still has the amplitude of 2. Uh, that doesn't really fit into our normal intuitions about counting, right? It doesn't feel like it makes sense. Okay, but complex numbers are not about counting in this kind of way. Let's look at this. This is a wave. What kind of wave? I don't know. Could be the surface of the ocean. It could be a sound wave, where the height represents the air pressure. It could be a wave of light, just flopping around in the electromagnetic field. Whatever it is, it's just a wave. Now, this is a very clean and pure wave that I'm using to illustrate the point, but it's a wave nonetheless. So how can we use numbers to capture what this wave is? Well, the first and most obvious thing is, if the wave is above the average level, if the wave is up, we'll say it's a positive number. And if the wave is down, we'll say it's a negative number. So let's go ahead and color it in, positive and negative. Alright, fair enough, it's not wrong. But, let's pause time for a second. Now look here. Right at the point where the wave is zero and going down, is that point really zero, or does that point exist in a harmonious continuum with the rest of the wave? Yeah, it's zero now, but it's part of a bigger picture, and you know it's just going to be changing soon. You know it'll soon be non-zero, so is that really zero in the same way that a flat line is zero? Or does it somehow have an amplitude, even though it's also kind of zero at the same time? So do you see an analogy between this thing that's kind of zero and kind of not zero, and the example we were looking at earlier when the two was pointing straight up, and it was also kind of zero and kind of not zero? Now what's more, look at this point over here, where it's also zero, but now it's going up. All of the same observations apply. It's kind of zero, but it's not really. It has some energy to it. Even though it's zero, it kind of is, kind of isn't. So now we can see that this number here is the opposite of the previous number that we were looking at. Because the previous one is on its way down, and this one is on its way up. Let's transform our perspective and use complex numbers to represent this wave. This is what a complex wave looks like. Notice that the amplitude is constant, and it's just the phase that's changing. So it's not moving up and down like the other wave. Now this is a very pure wave. This is a wave of the form e to the i theta, 
where in this case theta is some function of x and some function of time. Now let's plot the real part of this complex number, that is, how far left or right the number is in the complex plane, and you'll see that we can recover that wave we were looking at earlier. Let's show the imaginary component of this complex wave, that is, how far up and down the wave is in the complex plane, and you'll notice here we get a wave that looks very similar to the real part, but it's out of phase, such that it takes on maximum and minimum values when the real part is at zero, and vice versa. By the way, the function e to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta, where i is the imaginary unit. This equation is known as Euler's formula, well, one of his many formulas, and it gives us another way of thinking about what this complex wave is. When you're first getting into complex numbers, you will probably think about Euler's formula as the definition of what e to the i theta is, but as you become more comfortable with e to the i theta, you'll eventually just see that as the wave, and then the cosine and sine as a way of splitting it up into the real part and the imaginary part. By the way, let me just quickly say, on the topic of the imaginary part, Imaginary numbers are a misnomer, okay? They're just as real or just as imaginary as the real numbers. The complex numbers are a numerical structure, they're a holistic thing. You know, it doesn't make any sense to say imaginary and real, but whatever, this is the terminology we're stuck with, so it is what it is. Ultimately, it's a consequence of the fact that the imaginary numbers were names before they were understood, and that's, I think, one of Descartes' greatest mistakes. Well, that and dualism, but um, anyway, where were we? <laughs> what are we talking about here? To understand why it's useful to be able to represent a wave as a constant amplitude complex number whose phase is changing, we'll have to take a look at the nature of complex addition, multiplication, and how this relates to wave interference. We'll do that in a moment, but first I want to make a quick comment about why is it e to the i theta gives us this wave? I don't have time in this video to give a really satisfactory answer, but I can lead you in the right direction. So if you take derivatives of e to the i theta and, and sine of theta and cosine of theta, you can write these functions in terms of a Taylor series. When you do that, you'll find that e to the i theta has a term of theta at every degree, whereas cosine has even terms and sine has odd terms. And if you look closely at these series, you can see that the terms on the right-hand side of the equation zip together into the terms on the left-hand side of the equation. So by taking Taylor series, you can prove to yourself that in fact e to the i theta is cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Okay, so that was a bit of a tangent, but I think it's important for you to know. Now let's take a look at complex addition. If we have any two complex numbers, we can add them just like their vectors. So we put them tail to tip, or another way of looking at it is the sum is the diagonal of the parallelogram. So here I'm showing two complex numbers, both of which have magnitude 2, swinging around in the complex plane. The complex number between them is their sum. And you'll see that since the numbers both have magnitude 2, their sum has a magnitude of anywhere from 0 to 4. 0 when the two numbers are perfectly out of phase, 4 when the numbers are perfectly in phase, and some intermediary value when the angles are kind of in phase and kind of not in phase. And we'll see later how that has a very close relationship to the idea of constructive and destructive interference in waves. By the way, here's the algebraic formula for complex addition, and that's the same as adding vectors like the animation shows. Now let's let one of those twos become a little bit longer, and you can see a more general representation of complex addition. And you still see this effect where sometimes the numbers will align with each other and will add to the magnitude, sometimes they'll be oppositely aligned and they'll sort of destructively interfere. So that's a general phenomenon whenever you're adding complex numbers. And we can also multiply any two complex numbers. So to multiply complex numbers, you multiply their amplitudes and you add their phase angles relative to the positive real number line. So here I'm showing a couple numbers both with magnitude 2, they're swinging around in the complex plane, and I'm also showing their product. You'll notice that since the two numbers both have magnitude 2, their product will always have magnitude 4, but the phase angle of their product depends on the sum of the phase angles of the individual 2s. And of course that rule generalizes, so any two complex numbers, to multiply them, you multiply their magnitudes and add their phase angles. That's really useful. Because what it means is that if we have a complex number of unit length, but some phase angle in the plane, we can multiply that by some other complex number to shift its phase by the unit 1 number's phase angle. 
To demonstrate this idea of rotating the phase of a complex number by multiplying by a unit length complex number, consider the illustration that's on your screen now. Here I have a blue wave, and that's the real part of the function e to the ix. So the classic complex wave amplitude 1 function, you take the real part and it's basically, it's just cosine of x, right? Now the wave that's changing colors, that's the same function, that's the real part of the same function, except now the function is multiplied by some complex constant, let's call it a. a has magnitude 1, but its phase angle is changing. So I'm showing you here, the blue line with the dot at the end, that's the number 1 in the complex plane, right? The colorful line with the dot at the end, that's a. That's this unit length complex number whose phase is swinging around. And the colorful wave that's changing color, that's the real part of the wave that you get when you multiply by the complex number a. Now let's notice something. When a is 1, the two numbers overlap, and the two waves are the same. When a is negative 1, the two waves are completely opposite, so the sign of the wave is switching at every moment. What was formerly up is now down, and so on. But in all those angles in between, the waves are not just the same or not just totally opposite, but they're similar, they're phase shifted by some amount that's not a complete half wavelength. And so in this illustration, you can see how this notion of generalizing positivity and negativity that we see in the complex numbers actually has a genuine, natural, a very real interpretation. We can see this even more clearly if we put the sum of the two waves into this illustration as well. Now we can think about addition of waves in two ways. First, you can sweep along the x-axis and just add the value of the two waves at any point, and that gives you the value of the third wave. Or, you can add the complex amplitudes of the waves, you get a resulting complex number that's the sum of those complex numbers, and then you multiply that by the wave e to the ix, and that gives you the sum of the two waves. So you see there's this direct one-to-one -one relationship between complex addition and the interference of these waves. If you've studied signal processing, then you know that you can generate an arbitrary waveform by adding sine waves and cosine waves in the right amounts and frequencies. Well, complex numbers let us create a more unified and holistic way of doing Fourier analysis by adding waveforms that are these e to the i x kind of waves multiplied by a complex coefficient and then summing over frequencies and amplitudes in that basis. So the example I'm showing here of generating a square wave, you might associate that more with like uh, signal processing or something. In quantum mechanics, however, we use the idea of basis functions and superpositions all the time. Consider, for example, the quantum harmonic oscillator. I already made a video on the quantum harmonic oscillator, so I'm not going to rehash all of the details here. If you want to see like the Hamiltonian and Schrodinger's equation and all that good stuff, you can check out that video. But what I just want to point out here is that we can take this sum of energy eigenfunctions, the ground state and these few excited states, and if we add them all up, we can get the wave function of a particle that's oscillating in the quantum harmonic oscillator. And this is just one of the many ways that these basis functions can be added. But when you look at it, one thing to notice is that if you just look at the probability densities of each of the energy eigenstates, they're actually stationary. But when you add the eigenstates, because you're adding the complex numbers and there's that complex interference going on, the subsequent probability density of the sum of those states, the superposition of those states, is actually this thing that varies in time. And so here we can see this cool kind of dynamics coming out of the machinery of complex numbers. My main point in this video is just to get you familiar with the complex numbers to show you that ultimately they come from this notion of waves, and we'll see many examples of complex wave functions going forward. For example, I'm currently working on a video on the hydrogen atom, and so here I'll show you just a little preview of that. We have the longitudinal component of the hydrogen energy eigenstates. So this is what you get when you solve the azimuthal equation, you end up with the Hemholtz differential equation, and you can derive the fact that hydrogen has this quantized magnetic number m, which you learn about in chemistry, from the fact that the wave function has to loop back in on itself as you go around. Anyway, we'll come back to this later in the hydrogen video, but for now I'd like to look at a higher dimensional example of a complex wave function. So for example, here's a two-dimensional plane wave. It's defined in the plane of your screen, it's constant amplitude, and the color represents the phase of the wave function at every point. I've also superimposed these little arrows, and what the arrows represent is numbers in the complex plane. Now, I want to use this to illustrate a couple of points. First, when you look at a picture like this, it almost looks like a vector field. 
And there's a temptation to think that the complex numbers are embedded in this two-dimensional space, and that their direction is sort of pointing in a direction in that space. This is a common misconception, and I had this misconception for a while when I was learning quantum mechanics, because one of the things that confused me about complex numbers was, they're two-dimensional, right? So, why? <laughs> I mean, if you have a three-dimensional wave function, for example, shouldn't you have, like, some kind of three-dimensional thing? Like, how do you stick a two-dimensional arrow at a point in space? How does that even make sense? But I hope that based on everything you've seen so far, you realize that the two-dimensionality of the complex numbers actually is not about any direction in physical space. The fact that the complex numbers are two-dimensional is the fact that a wave is up and down, or left and right, or back and forth, or high pressure, low pressure. It's yin and yang. When you see that, then the confusion goes away. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point I want to bring up when it comes to plane waves is that these things, you will see these all over the place. Why? A couple of reasons. One, honestly, it's kind of one of the easiest solutions to all these wave equations that you'll encounter in quantum mechanics. But also, it can be used as a Fourier basis to construct these more complicated wave functions. Like earlier when we looked at the square wave and you could see how you can make an arbitrary waveform by adding a bunch of waves. Well, if you take a bunch of plane waves that satisfy, for example, the Schrodinger equation or the Klein-Gordon equation or the Dirac equation, although in that case you have bispinner fields more complicated, but whatever. If you have plane waves that satisfy some differential equation and you add them, you take their superposition, you can create these more complicated systems that also satisfy those equations. And in fact, in quantum field theory, the plane waves play a essential constitutive role in the second quantization that allows you to actually make a, a quantum field theory. Oh, I almost forgot, but earlier when we were looking at the complex multiplication, let's go back to that picture, except now I'm showing you something special. So these are two complex numbers that have amplitude 2, and their product has amplitude 4, but notice, this time the two numbers are complex conjugates of one another. That means that the imaginary component has flipped sign, in other words, it's been mirrored about the real axis. And so what we're seeing here is a number times its complex conjugate, and the result is always stuck on the real number line. Why is that? Well, add the angles. A complex number and its complex conjugate always have angles that add up such that you get back on the real axis. And for that reason, you'll often see the expression psi star psi as a way of expressing the amplitude squared of a complex number. In quantum mechanics, psi star and psi are very often the two slices of bread in an operator sandwich. But when you see psi star psi without any operator in between, just think of that as amplitude squared. And by the way, if psi is a wave function, then psi star psi is the probability density relating to that wave function. So if you want to find what's the probability of finding a particle in some volume of space, you just integrate psi star psi over that volume of space, and that gives you the probability of finding the particle there. Okay, I'm going to end this video on a cliffhanger by alluding to one of my favorite ideas of all time, which is beautiful and profound, and it relates to the complex numbers. And that is the idea that in quantum electrodynamics, a local U1 symmetry of the wave function implies electromagnetism. This is going to take a while to unpack, and I am going to come back to this in a future video. It's probably going to take like an hour, but we're really going to get into it, and it's going to be awesome. For now, I'll just show you these equations. If you know, you know. If you don't, stay tuned. But uh, it's a pretty profound concept. And basically what it comes down to is that uh, when you're doing quantum electrodynamics, you have a wave function. It's actually kind of four wave functions in one. But uh, if you impose the condition that you can swing your wave function around in phase space arbitrarily, then what you'll find is that in order to keep the Lagrangian density the same, that is, in order to not affect the laws of physics in quantum electrodynamics, you need the gauge symmetry of the electromagnetic four potential, which is what we actually see, right? So the four potential is kind of like relativistic voltage, and there's this inherent symmetry as a result of that, which has to do with the way that the derivatives map onto the electric and magnetic fields. Anyway, there's a lot there. I'm not going to go into it now, but just know that there are really deep and profound ideas relating to the complex numbers in quantum mechanics. This video today really has only scratched the surface, but I hope it's given you at least some intuition for the complex numbers. One final thing that I want to say. Becoming familiar with the complex numbers takes time. It takes hours and hours of, like, plotting equations and solving problems and doing things. So you're not supposed to get the ideas right away. No one ever does. But, uh, you know, hey, a journey of a thousand miles is, you know, one footstep at a time, or however that saying goes. And I hope you keep on going on that path, because physics is really one of the most wholesome things a person can do, I think. But maybe I'm biased. 
All right. <laughs> well, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, have a great day.